Nature Breakthroughs with Dr. Wild Ben Goldman. Conversations with changemakers in a world gone mad. To discover what you need for personal, organizational, and societal change, get your free download of Three Ancient Rituals Smart Entrepreneurs Use to Bounce Back from Shifts in the Market and Inside Themselves. Go to www.naturebreakthroughs.com. Yes, you pull them, yes, you pull them till they bite down On the lies that you build from my doubts I don't want money, I don't want cars I just want to be free Yeah, this is going to be on YouTube? It's going to be on, the whole world will see this, Manny Yeah, that's all I need, especially I, I didn't even comb my hair <laughs> You want to comb your hair? I can talk to you while you're combing your hair I got a Korean style haircut, but uh, you can't tell anymore it looks like it always does. You know Kim, Kim Jong Un. Yeah, you got that kind. Oh yeah, yeah I can see it from the side. <laughs> That's a North Korean haircut. No, oh, it's South Korean too. It's really in style. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Doctor Emmanuel Ness. Do you have a middle initial? No, I, I don't. Call me Doctor either. I don't have to call you Doctor. No, I don't usually go by that. You go by Manny. Yeah, Manny Ness. Manny Ness. This, um, well, this is the first time I've done this. And the name of my podcast is called Nature Breakthroughs um, Conversations with Change Makers in a World Gone Mad. So it's really a, a podcast about change and how people deal with change and what people think about change and what kind of changes people have done in their lives. And I mean, it's a broad. Okay. Topic. And maybe this will really be a, like, uh, have like millions of hits and you'll become a, what do you call it, a Instagram star. See what happens. You're a professor of political science, right? I focus on political economy. And so you're really uh, a, uh, like a world expert on, on all kinds of societal changes, right? Like, like social movements and revolutions. And I have some of your, I found some of the, your books that I have and I know this, None of them, I don't have your signature on any of them, but um, you've written lots of books about all kinds of major changes in the world, right? Uh, I work primarily on a question of uh, labor, political organization, migration, uh, workers' movements, and uh, that's about it. How important are those uh, social movements to to the shape of the world and how the world will it has changed in the past and will change in the future you really want me to do this I'm tired that, that that was too big of a question <laughs> <laughs> uh you know i watched this guy i got i got um kind of inspired you ever heard of this guy named joe rogan yeah he's he's um he endorsed Bernie Sanders. Yeah, that's all. I, I I didn't know anything about him until I heard he endorsed uh, Bernie Sanders. And then I went and listened to his, his podcast, and it was really, I mean, it was excellent. To, there was one part of it I didn't, didn't like that much because they got, they started conflating the mass shootings with mental illness. Um, but they, they, they didn't mean to. Do, do that and it, it was a great it was a really good interview i thought and right. and that guy impressed me but he's he's kind of controversial i didn't expect him to be uh like a progressive but he's got you know there's an aspect of is he okay. I, don't, I don't really know much about him you know i think what he is is he's uh like a radical at where the kind of radical right and the radical left can kind of be similar in the sense that he's you know he's kind of like libertarian and i don't really know that much about him i just know that he interviews all different kinds of people all across the spectrum and um Sorry. the only reason why i brought that up is because he 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 didn't ask questions he just had conversations with people today i've been taught i taught i've been speaking with a uh, person about the uh, and yesterday and the last couple of weeks of different people around about the rise of the right and how it's sometimes conjoined to the left, uh, which is very dangerous. 
Uh, say, say, what do you mean? Uh, there, there, there happens to be uh, a, a growing movement amongst uh, uh, activists, uh, academics, um, and so forth, uh, to um, oppose American imperialism and to oppose American global power and hegemony, uh, which I also oppose. Uh, but many of these groups uh, are tainted by connections to quasi-fascist organizations, unfortunately. And I have some idea of where that's coming from, uh, but uh, we have to be very careful uh, on the left because um, of the potential of being tainted by these groups. So I have, um, you know, this perspective that uh, when we look at the ruling class, which is the capitalist class of the world, that it's divided between its different um, fractions, as Palazzo said, you know, in his work, which you're aware of, uh, and that it has its uh, conservative side, uh, the people like the Koch brothers, and it has its more liberal side, like the you know, people in Hollywood and so forth. And, uh, you know, different points of time, there could be capitalists or business people who move in one direction or another based on their material interests and their, also their ideology. And, um, you know, people who are uh, experts and uh, people who study uh, political movements uh, are, are often uh, influenced by causes that they believe in and are very strongly influenced by them. Uh, so for instance, I'm opposed to NATO and NATO expansionism. I'm opposed to economic sanctions. And um, I'm opposed to uh, you know, rendition and a lot of the policies that the United States is engaged in. Uh, but it matters who I work with. Uh, so uh, I and many other people have to be a little bit more cautious about you know, who's funding you are uh, the organization or what people you're engaged in uh, politically and so forth, because they may be tainted in some respect by elements of the right. So for instance, there was, uh, and I might get this wrong, uh, one of the major supporters of the Trump administration was this right wing uh, person on YouTube whose name escapes me. I think it was, uh, War.com, I forget the name of his, uh, you know what I'm talking about? No. Uh, he, he was sued by the uh, people in Connecticut, the families of the uh, people who, who were killed in that mass shooting. Uh, the guy was challenging whether they had actually did take place. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course it took place. But, uh, but anyway, there, there's, you know, people like Rush Limbaugh, you know, he may be opposed to a war. So, you know, we have to be very careful not to work with people who are, uh, you know, rooted in a fascist ideology. So anyway, I've been, I've been looking into that. Have you, have you heard this phrase, cancel culture? Yeah. Is that, so you're talking about like canceling people? No, I, no I'm not talking about that at all. Uh, I'm referring to uh, the care that is necessary, just like it was in the early to mid 20th century, uh, because I think we're in some cases replaying it uh, in associating oneself with uh, elements that are unprincipled, that uh, are supporting fascism. And by fascism, I'm talking about hatred of specific people, uh, nationalism on a profound level, uh, as we saw in Nazi Germany and uh, fascist uh, Spain and Italy and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, there might have been a few, there might be a couple of things uh, that you might agree with uh, uh, in these movements. So, for instance, um, um, you so, know, anti-imperialism. So, yeah, so. I mean, isn't what you're saying always the case? Is what, what, is what you're saying is different is that there's more fascists or, or I mean don't you always have to be careful who you associate with and no I think there are a lot more today than there ever were before so th that's what's different yes I think so yes and I think they're they've expanded uh, and um, 
what uh, I refer to as, and others might as well, as the red-brown alliance, uh, which means that, you know, red mean, meaning socialism and democracy, and brown meaning fascism. And, uh, you know, red meaning anti-imperialism and brown meaning fascism. So we have to be careful about, you know, small groups of people who might be, or large groups, etc., who, who might have, you know, connections to uh, ultra-nationalists. So and like 10, 10 years ago, you didn't have to be worried about that? No, not on the same level. I think uh, because uh, there's a growth of uh, inter-imperialist rivalries uh, between countries uh, in the last five, 10 years, five years, 10 years, um, there is um, uh, money and uh, a lot of attention that's being focused on Uh, on, on causes that you, one might believe in, but you have to be very careful because you might be working with the wrong party. Uh, that's all I'm saying. So, for instance, I, I, I think that people should have the freedom to speak the language they wish any way they want. Uh, but I don't believe in people who are interested in unifying the white race. And uh, you'll, you'll note that there are a lot of groups today, I've, it's an unprecedented level, that there are not just groups, but sentiment out there of people who see whiteness as something that should be unified um, as opposed to other races of the world. You know, so I, I'm very, very aware of it and it's, uh, it's very disturbing. I can give examples, but some of them are too personal. Well, I don't know if we want to get into a whole, what well, we could. So when you say, they want to unify the the race. What what does that mean? How is that different than you know, than other uh, racial identities wanting to uh, claim their identity and 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 unify or, or reach out to others? Well, like, we see the uh, rise of the right in, in in Europe. So, for instance, in France, uh, I mean, throughout Germany, etc., we see the rise of a nationalist right wing, which is tends to be a white right wing. Uh, and I would argue that it extends uh, into England and the United States and also into Russia, uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, where you have white peoples who would say, you know, we, we don't want to associate ourselves with uh, people of other races or nationalities or religions and so forth. And that what we would like to see is a grand alliance of white people. Uh, this guy by the name of uh, Alexander Dukin, uh, a Russian political philosopher, who uh, sees it as uh, the third circle that, you know, we, we have to get over capitalism, we have to get over socialism, but let's uh, work with, uh, or in other words, work with, you know, these are, these are all historical ideas, but we have to um, unify white people because they're, or Russian people, etc. however you want to conceive them, because they're in some ways better or more worthy. Uh, and we have our garden varieties in this country as well. And I think it's a dangerous precedent that we're, uh, we will have to be even more aware and alert about in the years to come, especially now. In some ways, that, that, that's, that's the same as any other kind of racial identity mo movement with, but how the kind of, you know, my understanding of of people that that work on racial issues is it's all about who's got the power and who and so if there's an if if it's a if it's the majority or the, the the group in power that is doing it it's it's you know it's more it's much more of a problem than i mean that's what's called institutionalized racism whereas if it's people that don't have the institutional power that are trying to mobilize their I get, you know, other people that share the same identity, it doesn't have the same kind of uh, association with the right. In fact, it, it's usually associated with the left. That's what I'm saying. We have to be very worried about the left working with the right because it could be associated in different side. I don't know whether it's, uh, I think white people have power in most places in the world. That, that's uh, what I'm saying, that, that, that you wouldn't, I, I suspect you wouldn't be as critical of, of black people claiming, you know, a black power movement or trying to associate with each other because you don't see them as have historically having the institutional power uh, to oppress white people. 
No, you don't see this. It's not. It's not something that's pre uh, prevalent amongst uh, black people. I what is? What is it? Uh, this form of uh, racism. I mean, you might find in any society you find people who are racist or anti-specific uh, uh, racial group, but I don't see it as prevalent amongst people from. Uh, when you see, what uh, you said, South Africa, for instance, no. You were, talking, you were talking about unifying the race. You weren't talking about, uh, is that code for oppressing other races? Uh, I think so, dominating the world. So you, you were using the, that as a, as a kind of encoded way of talking about what concerns you? Uh, one of the things that concerns me is something that I'm very cautious about. Um, and I've run into a number of people whose, whose views are that there should be a, uh, you know, kind of a, an alliance between European or white people on a global basis. Uh, of course, you find racists throughout the world. There's no question about that. And that's very, very dangerous. Uh, so you're right about that. I mean, I, my personal belief is that, that uh, as long as we give significance to the concept of race we're all racist um and that you know the, that race is just a, a construct and it's got you know profound historical consequences um but but it's but it's I, I think it's it's um you know it's hard to say this but it but to claim for anyone to claim that they're not racist to me is a is a fantasy it, it's just uh it, it means that th that you're you know we've been so all of us have been so indoctrinated with the concept of race and it's not just about being indoctrinated it's also um you know i think there's a when people look different than you th there's a there's a biological i don't know if it's biological but i don't know how much it's an, a matter of being taught to react um, but it's a form of reactivity that is so pro programmed by early, early in our lives that um, uh, it doesn't mean you hate, you know, most people asso associate the phrase racism with someone who hates or thinks they're better than another, another race. But for me, I kind of, I see race, race, this whole thing is, as um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going on about this because if you want to overcome, I mean, to me, one issue is what you, what you've brought up, which is how do you avoid associating, mistakenly associating, with people that have racial ideologies that you disagree with, right? But what's what's the bigger question is how do we. Uh, get people to stop doing that shit how do we how do we get people to not have hatred towards other races right yeah i'm listening to you i don't necessarily i i think we're talking past each other why you don't think that's the bigger issue no i don't think they're there i don't think one is uh bigger than the other i think these are very interesting discussions uh but i think they're different issues uh, dealing with a uh, you, you, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't an ideal... You know, at the beginning of this podcast, you were discussing the, the degree to which uh, I focus on labor and, uh, or I was saying it maybe, social movements, revolutions, and, and, and on and so forth and so on. And I, I, I think the, that it's crucial to uh, get beyond uh, and, and exclude oneself from uh, groups that are racist or fascist of one kind or another. So... Um, that's one thing. Uh, it also argued that, um, so I, 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 you know, we can have disagreements about what you just said, or you can disagree with me. That's fine. Well, I'm, I'm just saying well, I, I don't think of myself as being programmed around anything, but of course we are who we are in a local, uh, you know, we're, we're born into and so forth. That's has some kind of. You're, you've, you've uh, gotten beyond pr any kind of programming. Is that what you're saying? I don't know what programming is. I, I mean, some people think of programming as being uh, the CI programming people. So maybe <laughs> being that's programmed. one form, but I mean, it's programming by programming. I mean, you know, the kind of psychological things that we take to be true from an early age that are not necessarily true. It's just, they're just conventions. 
Yeah, so we're talking about two different things. Well, so I'm, I'm just saying... If you want to move to that discussion that you're interested in, I'm, I'm happy to do so. And we can just uh, put closure on the other discussion. I'm not sure how it's two different things. I'm, I'm, what I'm asking you is, one, one issue is, is to stay away from people who you disagree with. But uh, the problem is, is that they're still going to cause trouble in the world. And so the bigger problem is how do we, how do we, you know, how do we eliminate that kind of thinking in the world? Don't you think? On an existential basis, but you're not going to, I don't see that being eliminated in the way that you, you would say so, it's so easy. Uh, choices that were made uh, in modern history with respect to uh, revolutionary movements and so forth. Uh, and um, sometimes people took the wrong road and uh, they worked with people who were, you know, much more interested in uh, advancing nationalist uh, causes as opposed to uh, common causes of humanity. I mean, I can give you, you know, examples from the Russian Revolution, for instance. But uh, so I, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, it would be nice to achieve the level of commonality and uh, purge ourselves or remove these kinds of differences that uh, create so much conflict and destruction. But I, I think that I'm interested in political movements and social movements, and I don't think that that's in front of me right now. I, in my interactions with people, I, I think it's a very important thing, but I, I'm not working on I, 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 you know, I, I refuse to work with people who consider themselves uh, better because of their nationality, their race, etc. Just uh, will cut. Well, that, I mean, that, uh, that makes sense. I, I wouldn't want to work with people that, like that either. Yeah. Um, but what, what do you think about being living in a country where, you know, I don't know what the polls are now, but like literally half of them support, uh, you know, President Trump, for example, mm -hmm. and half don't, half kind of despise him and half support him. Do you, uh, does that mean, and, and I'm sure the people that you want to work with are a much smaller fraction of the half that, uh, that despise him, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you like some of the ones that support him, but, but what, no, I, what? I, no, I, it's, I, I, I don't, but I, I, I think I don't have any, I have equal disdain for Democrats and Republicans. Well, I, I'm just saying that when, when in a situation like in America where there's such a po opposing views, um, the strategy of, of, uh, just staying away from, from, well, I mean, I get the point of not wanting to, to, uh, uh, not want, not wanting to develop, you know, many kinds of relationships with people that are, that don't, that you don't agree with, but on, but Absolutely. how do we move forward? If, yeah, you know, uh, somebody told me today, it's funny, I, I didn't watch the State of the Union address, but uh, I, I spoke to somebody about it. And she told me that uh, it was really odd the way um, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, would not shake the hand of the president. Oh, no, the president would not shake her hand. Right. Uh, and that she subsequently, I didn't see any of this. At the end of the speech, she ripped up the speech. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm not really interested in uh, Democratic Republican Party politics at all. I, I, I could care less. Although I am very much concerned, I think that there is, you know, maybe tangibly more differences of opinion amongst these various groups, these various parties. But I, I think that, you know, it, it shows, you know, kind of level of uh, uh, infantile disorder uh, on both sides. You know, on the one, on the one hand, uh, no pun intended, Trump will not shake Nancy Pelosi's hand after she extends it to him which I think is a form of infantilism. And then on the other hand, uh, you have Nancy Pelosi tearing up the speech, which might be, you know, uh, a pile of shit, but you, you don't do that. It, it's a form of disrespect. Well, they're, they're definitely both disrespecting each other. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that, that's a whole other issue, I think. So you don't... Uh... I, I mean, uh, you know, 
other than, uh, you know, if you want me to talk about the Russian Revolution, I'm willing to. Uh, but if we're talking about everyday life, I think that we're finding much more uh, le higher levels of disrespect than ever before. Uh, and that it is propagated by people who we see who are uh, very well known, the leaders, the movie stars. or From, from a perspective, I, I mean, I suspect you would consider yourself a progressive uh, person is that no? No. What what well, when what label would you apply to yourself? Um, I, I usually don't apply labels. To All right, well, forget the label. Yeah. So you you would, I mean, to me, it's kind of remarkable that somebody like Bernie Sanders is taking you know, has a, has a good shot at um, at the at the presidency. Doesn't that seem like a change to you that, that that would definitely not have happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago or, you know, in the last, well, certainly not during our adult lifetime. Nobody close to, the, to Bernie Sanders had a shot at the presidency. Well, I, I, I think it's very interesting. It's an interesting phenomenon. And uh, I, I hope he does well, but I don't think he's going to be much of a change. Why? I mean, look at Corbynism, for instance, in Britain, uh, where uh, you had a socialist who became a leader of the Labour Party, a person who believed in nationalization of the railroads and a lot of the infrastructure and, you know, in enforcing a better system of uh, national health care and so forth. And um, he became a standard bearer of the party and he was destroyed in the elections. Um, but there was a lot of... Uh, disagreement within the party over whether he would be that nominee. Uh, I, I, do I think it's, just, do I think it's a, you, you think it is, so maybe you want to talk about it. I mean, I'm not necessarily a supporter of Sanders. I don't vote in elections, so. Why, why don't you vote in elections? Uh, I don't think they make any difference. So what, so you, what, what Probably. makes, what do you do that, what do you do that make, what do you think makes a difference that you're devoting yourself to? Uh, don't know. Maybe nothing. Come on, you're you're very active. Uh, well, I know I don't know. I don't I don't vote in. I, I'm not very much interested in elections, but there. I mean, I am interested. I'm very interested in elections, but I don't vote. Uh, I so don't what? Know. Instead of voting, what do you do? What do you think is more important than voting? No, I feel like a kid in a chair who's. Uh, okay, so this is funny because I that, this, is what they, this is what they told me about that guy Joe Rogan is that he never asks direct questions, so I can see why 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 I shouldn't do it. Um, oh, but, really? Can he get something out of the direct? Uh, yeah, I, he never asks direct questions. He just has a conversation. So, which is so I'm not used to that because I I prepared questions and I'm like, how do I do this without asking questions? So instead of asking you questions, I'm like just talking. And then that's provoking, so it's kind of working, but uh, it's kind of weird. You're trying to provoke me, is that what, uh, oh, right, you were just saying. No, I'm not trying to provoke you, I'm just trying to converse, and uh, I can okay. see that it... it, uh, it uh, ben, I, I, I'm not the person to um, take stock of my own work and life, uh, or to promote it, or to say this is what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, I think you know that uh, about me already, that I don't really talk about myself that much. Well, I'm I'm asking you what you believe and what you what what uh, gets you what what uh, gets you fired up, you know what you think is important. I'm not asking, uh, you know, so so that if if a person, you know, if if you don't think voting is important, um, I know that you're very concerned about the world and society. So, I, I, you know, I'm just curious what what do you think is more important than that. Right, right now, I'm very much concerned with the coronavirus. Why? Because it's potentially, it could devastate and kill so many people. I know that it may not be as serious as some people think it is, and there's a lot of people who are going berserk over it, but I, I, I'm very concerned with it. Uh, I yeah. care about humanity. And I mean, I don't... I don't know. Lewis, uh, very serious. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know... Uh, I, Started an email from somebody. There's some kind of film or art exhibit on Wuhan. I think it's kind of uh, insulting to discuss uh, Wuhan and its problems with uh, 
the Chinese state right now when you have the coronavirus going on. But uh, so what gets me, uh, you know, what gets me worked up? I, I don't really know. I don't know the answer, and I couldn't say. The, the, um, I, li I like you know, the the things that I know about Wuhan is is it's it's the um, I can't remember the technical phrase for it, but the 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 slope of its of of the increase of its prevalence is pretty staggering. But it's the its mortality rate is is much lower than other uh, vi similar viruses. So that's the the good news. Yeah, that's, that's, the coronavirus. yeah, the good news is that it's they think it's only about a three percent uh fatality compared to others that are thirty percent or you know or yeah, more. Two percent. The, the bad news is is that it's uh there's a phrase for the slow spreading, uh, it's spreading. It's spreading super exponentially. fast. But so um ex exponentially, I would say. Well, they all do. They all spread exponentially, but this is spreading at a slope that's much fat, high, higher than the others. Um, so that's the, the concern. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I think behind this is that, again, I, I, this gets back to my concerns about the environment, is that as we destroy the environment, we're exposing ourselves to all of these microbes and stuff that haven't been exposed to humans before. So this is you know, this coronavirus comes from bats or I don't know, some kind of species that are, that were pre humans previously didn't have that much to do with. And be, as we, you know, further and further invade areas that, that humans haven't been in and, you know, we're going to, this is what happens. And I think that's, that's globalization, kind of, right? Globalization where people have uh, interchanged in a very direct way. Uh, well, the globalization helps to spread. But it's it's the I think it's the capitalism it's the it's the um, uh, mad rush to to gen create money that causes the, the wiping out of these natural areas that, that that's you know that causes the the uh, initial infections in the first place. Yeah, you're an expert in that field. Well, I'm not an expert, but I mean that's that's my. I know opinion. you've you've done a lot of uh, around. Uh, hazardous waste and so forth. Yeah, and epidemiology. Um, but you said that concerns you. Um, well, it's a very big concern, you know, people are really stressed out about it. Yeah. I mean, the darkest view is that there's so many people, you know, and um, on the planet, you mean? On the planet. And it's just, it's like, you know, part, part of it is we, we got to stop. We got to stop. Uh, we just got to stop consuming and producing and like to the degree that we're doing without uh, understanding how it affects the, 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 the ecosystem that keeps us healthy. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a very serious issue. I mean, uh, you know, I didn't know where you're going to go with what we, we have to stop, but I think actually it's about consumption and profit that uh, is really driving driving this, um, and that uh, it's very very serious the the fact that um, you know I mean North Americans Americans in particular uh, we consume five percent no twenty percent of all energy in the world. And we only make up five percent of the population of the planet. Yeah, um, you know, everybody's got a car. Everybody's got two cars, maybe. Yeah, um, people are using uh, fossil fuels at a great level. I have to say that you know it, th those are you know that that shows inequality. And you were asking me before what I care about. I do care about inequality and poverty on a uh, global basis as well as. To a degree within countries, uh, especially you know most humans are living in poverty, so that's that's the greatest concern I would have, even more than the environmental destruction. But the people who are going to be mostly affected by coronavirus and other diseases will be poor and working class people because they're exposed on the street or subways or cafeterias, you name it, you know, uh, to a higher degree than you know ordinary people.
Uh, well, they're also, as you know, the well, most. They are ordinary people. <laughs> yeah, well, they're also most the most exposed to the environmental ha hazards yeah. in general. So. Um, yeah, global inequality is a very big issue. It's the biggest issue I think uh, on the planet uh, that has to be addressed. And how, how do you have any um, uh, any ideas? For what? For how to address it? Um, I'm not an expert in it, but it's something that I, I'm interested in studying through past uh, efforts in the uh, 20th century and how they improve the lives of people um, in ways that we don't really see on the same level today. During the 20th century, there are a number of initiatives on a global level, I call them revolutions, that transform the world. So anyway, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, so you, even the Iranian Revolution to a degree. So, so you think uh, what's necessary is a revolution? I didn't say that. I said I'm very interested in it. I think uh, it has to be a certain kind of revolution, you know. Uh, but I I um, I don't think. Uh, a bunch of people gathering together in downtown Wall Street are going to make any change. What, uh, what kind? What kind of revolution? Uh, but you know, you need a very disciplined uh, revolutionary movement that's committed to equality and nonviolence. But sometimes violence is inevitable, unfortunately. That will transform society and improve the lives of the vast majority of people. I mean, take the the example of the Soviet Union, the, the decline in poverty after the socialist of power. Now, of course, that opens up a whole uh, discussion, which I don't want to have. Okay. Um, At this moment, but, uh, you know, some, sometimes you can have interviews about generalities. But, well, um, So what are you in? You broke up. What was the question? You're interested in change, right? Yeah, and you covered a lot of it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a way to wrap up this, but... Um, well, I don't think we even started. No, we didn't. But we started... Uh, nor, nor was this a real coherent discussion because it was all over the place, all over the map. It was all over the map, but that's part of your work. You're all over the map. You're, you you, you uh, do... That's not good. What? You, have to, you have to be very focused in everything you do. Why? Well, if you want to make any difference in the world, uh, you need really uh, focused work. Uh, do you think? Committed. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, you know, you're right about me maybe being all over the map. I, I need to focus. I didn't mean that in a bad way. I meant that you're very global but in your I, I need to focus. Uh, I, I think I, I'm overcommitted. Well, why, why do, you, do you think it's important to make a difference? Uh, you have to spend your time in a very efficient way, and I, I'm, maybe I'm not doing that. What's what do you think is? All right, so you just finished a book, right? You focused on that book completely for what two years, maybe? Um, I think almost, maybe eighteen months. I spent on it, a and uh, I'm working on three books, and so it's hard to focus on all three at the same time. So well, that's good. Uh, but you've got you've got publishers, and you're you know you probably got collaborators, and so it's exciting. Yeah, you froze, or did I froze? Oh well, whatever. We froze. It always seems to happen. I don't know the technology. Has, when the person gets excited and is about to get to their critical point, then it freezes. Like, yeah, you might have had. You know, it might be. It's probably frozen because of uh, the lack of five G in this country. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. It may not have anything to do with the system. It could be just... Uh, yeah, it's the connection. That's, that's yeah. what they say, it's the connection. Yeah. Where's the most 5G, like in Korea? I don't know. I mean, isn't China producing the... Uh, I don't know. I, I heard Huawei that... Huawei is the leader in 5G technology. I, I heard that Tesla just launched... They have these satellite trains, they call them. And um, it's for the 5G. And they... The astronomers are concerned that they're much brighter than they said they would be, and they're going to completely, you know, there's there's sky pollution now too, or what they call light pollution. You won't be able to see the stars anymore. They're going to be all 
all these uh, satellites for the 5G and you, won't, you literally won't be able to see the constellations. That's very, very sad. Yeah, it's so, wild. Um, even if you're in uh, remote places of the world? Yeah, it doesn't matter because it's, 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 they're, they're orbiting all over. Too many satellites, the number of satellites have grown. That's true. Well, and that this, uh, my, yeah, my understanding, it's not the existing satellites, it's the ones that, that uh, Musk is, is um, launching now that they're concerned about. It's the 5G satellites they're concerned about. Yeah, and that's one of the most profitable companies in the world. Or maybe not I, profitable. I don't know about that, but they're, I just read that their uh, their stock prices went up uh, like insanely this past year. They they were they weren't they were like you know very volatile. Uh, I stopped looking at it, and then last year I think it went up. I forgot I read what it was, but like four hundred percent or something crazy. Yeah. I, heard that. You know, I mean, he, I think he's an interesting person, but he's part of your capitalist class for sure. I mean, he's now, I think he's now worth, they said $35 billion because of at his current stock uh, value or something. But, um, you know, half of what he does, I find super interesting. And then half of what I, he does, I find horrifying, like, you know the his 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 emphasis to try to build a you know terraform mars instead of focusing on you know on the the planet we're currently on i just find it like uh if that is that really what humans want is to trash this place and then go somewhere else that, that and try to recreate what's already here it's so absurd it is i agree it's definitely true. Uh, the question you said, well, so you consider yourself a progressive. Uh, you didn't press that. Oh, you, you want me to ask? I can ask some more. Uh, no, I consider myself a socialist. A socialist. And which is not a progressive. How, yeah. What's the distinction? Oh, one, one is transformative. The other is a meaning. Actually, I think most of these terms are meaningless. Whether one considers themselves a... I don't, I don't like words that end with IST anyway. But, uh, or IVE. A progressive doesn't, and socialist or IVE, uh, oh, IVE, progressivist or whatever. Uh, I, I don't think they mean anything. I know a lot of people who are um, mainstream Democrats who are now calling themselves Marxists. If you take a look at the um, recent polls, I think a majority of young people under twenty-one or twenty-five are saying they support socialism over capitalism. They don't even know what socialism is, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I have a great degree of uh, concern over those issues. I think that um, people will call themselves Marxists and they don't even know what it is. That's why I answered where I said, no, I'm not a progressive. I don't believe in, I don't even know what that means. So, you know, I think people have to learn how to define the terms first. You know, I even made the mistake early on in this conversation that, you know, I oppose fascism. But even that is an, another ISM or IST word. Uh, but I'm very much concerned with uh, intolerance toward other people. Uh, so that's what I could certainly say that. Uh, well, having known you for how many decades now? Is it four? I don't know. I think four decades we've known each other. Yeah. Uh, I would say that you're throughout your whole, the whole time I've known you, one of your preoccupations has been exactly what you just talked about. It has been uh f trying to figure out where how where you fit in the spectrum of uh, ideologies that f float around and may and and it's back to what you originally said trying to also figure out who really are your friends who are people you want to associate with and who don't you want to associate with that's that's been like that's been a you might not see it in yourself but it's but it's something i see very clearly that it's uh -huh. been it's, an, it's, it's something that motivates you a lot. I, I don't want to associate myself with intolerant people of any type, uh, against any kind of, you know, any, of any type of person. So but, I don't want to stay away from those types. But, but do you hear what I'm saying? It that it's a it's a big concern of yours. Yeah. Like you don't you you're not someone that would say, ah, oh, he's just a fascist. I, I don't mind him. He's got a nice mustache. You know, he's still a good guy. 
you, you're someone that that it's it's important for you to you where people stand and where you're what you're how you fit in how you who you associate with or who you uh yeah. you know like you know, the labels are important to you. And I'm not saying you want, I don't think you really want a label applied to you, but you're, you're very careful about, uh, about how, about distinguishing where people are coming from and trying to figure out wh how, whether you think it's right or wrong. Yeah, but those labels are meaningless. That's what I would say, right? Ultimately. Well, I mean, they're, they're not, they're not, me they have, it's not that they have zero meaning. They have historical meanings that, that change and, you know, they have lots of meaning. People define them. Yeah. You have to define it first. Yeah. But they've I, had, you know, some meaning, some phrases have had pretty clear meaning for cer in certain contexts, but then you take them out of the context and, if, yeah, of course it doesn't, it becomes crazy. Yeah. Um, they, they, you know, the, I heard a um, Christian What's her name? Kristen Gillibrand on the radio today, uh, talking about the speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi talking about Pelosi tearing up the speech, and um, she, and she said, you know, because some like a listener on on NPR or something had asked, is not going to be terrible. Uh, you know, a terrible icon icon image for the Democrats. You know, like you said, showing that she's being infantile. But um, Jill Brand said that she, yeah, she gets that. But she also, you know, just, just listening to what she considered and what Pelosi considered just just complete untruths coming out of uh, Trump's, you know, out of Trump's mouth. Where he and you're saying like labels don't mean anything. It's like, you know, it's amazing when you when you listen to some of the things that Trump says. Uh, it, where it has no Obama, Obama was no different, uh, Bush was no different. You know, yeah, they're all articulating, you know, kind of uh, lies and distortions about the world, exactly. So, that there, so but, but but she tore up the speech, you know. We know we know who Trump is, he's a very dangerous uh, nationalist, yeah. I mean, they're just two different uh, elements of the. They say it's a capitalist system, right? Or a two-party system, continuum between Democrats and Republicans that in my view is not too far away from one another. If you think about it, uh, I, I think on some issues of globalization, they disagree. But, uh, you know, uh, President Obama went to war against uh, a number of countries, five, six countries, you know, destroying the lives of many people. Yeah. You know, Afghanistan, uh, Libya, and uh, Syria, etc. Well, he's not to the same degree, but the U.S. is responsible for that. Yemen. Uh, so, whoever is going to be the president, who is ever going to be the speaker of the house, is going to be pretty nasty, in my view. So, I guess I, I don't support the system. So, it's very hard to say who I am when I really reject uh, the American uh, system of uh, global intervention and. Uh, subterfuge, uh, dominating, world, dominating world resources. Actually, the Democrats liked that part. You know, they were upset when Trump said he was going to withdraw from Syria. Doesn't that tell you something? Yeah. It's actually, I, I, I don't know what to say. I actually think the United States should withdraw from Syria. I thought it was interesting when you said, it's hard to know who I am when I reject the system. Yeah. That's a very profound statement. Like, why? Why would your rejecting the system make your own identity put your own identity in question? Um, uh, I, I totally empathize with it, uh, but it's 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 a paradox, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's not. Is it a paradox or is it, it's a reality about me? I, I reject the American uh, and capitalism and American system. Yeah, no, I. I mean, I've, I've felt that way in a more kind of, uh, like, just, let's say, just from a careerist perspective, when I reached a point in my life where I just had no idea 
I didn't want to work for, you know, the government. I didn't want to work for corporations. I, I just didn't have any idea how to plug into. Yeah. I'm saying I, I, I have felt the exact same thing you're saying, where, whereas if you reject the system, you, you, it, it affects your own identity. It affects, it affects, yeah. it makes you feel like kind of lost. You know, and maybe that's what a lot of Americans feel. Uh, uh, they feel the same way. That's why people don't vote. They feel like they're really not participants. And I don't think they are to a large degree. Um, and so, you know, uh, when you want to put yourself on the spectrum from left to right, it's very difficult to do so when uh, you disagree with the entire basis of the, the government. But, you know, if I were an immigrant coming to the United States saying that, it wouldn't be allow, they wouldn't allow me to have citizenship. So they would I'm not. not agreeing, but um, they certainly would not. Yeah. Yeah, you have to support the Constitution, right? So to speak. My my girlfriend's studying for her citizenship uh, test, and it was funny. She like some of the questions they asked, like most Americans couldn't answer. Like most people don't know the name of the vice president, probably, or the or uh, there there were questions. You know, yeah, just basic stuff like, you know, that I think most most Americans wouldn't have a clue what they, what, what, you know, they'd say, oh, it's, I, you know, they wouldn't know. Just factoids, you know. Yeah. Maybe they're not that important anyway. Well, they're important if you want to be a citizen. I've been asked to appear on a number of television shows where I'd say no. Because it's just not, I'm really not looking to um, become a uh, Instagram star, or whatever the case may be. I don't know. We'll find I out. Think, I think what most, it's not about what you think, it's what, you know, how you, whether you say whether it's correct or not. So that's. It's I, whether, it's not what you think, it's whether you, someone else says it's correct. Is that what you're saying? Whether what you say is, is a accurate and correct, because uh, most of the, you know, we talk about fake news. Most of the reporting is actually interviews with people who just have ideas. Have you listened to MSNBC, Fox, or CNN recently? I don't. I don't watch it either, because who cares what people think? It's like meaningless. But you'll do a good job at it if you want to be uh, one of these hosts. I mean, you know what I want to do? I want to take people on these wild cold weekends. So why don't we talk about the environment, and, uh, about personal transformation? I can talk about that. You can? I have questions like, what was the most pivotal change in your life? The first question I had was, what's your earliest memory of an important change in your life? And how did it affect you? Uh, those are really personal questions because I would answer them accurately. <laughs> they are personal. Uh, I mean, I would say probably when I was exactly six or seven years old, I probably even before then, when I recognized the world around me and I came to the conclusion that there is no God. That at was very six, early. At six or seven? Earlier. And before that, you thought there was a God? I didn't really know, but I was, uh, you know, inculcated with this ideas of uh, the uh, idea of a supernatural being. And uh, I, I just didn't buy it. I was just listening to it initially and I was like, no, this doesn't make any sense. And then, and then you, you said no and then never turned back? I never turned back. I mean, I, you know, obviously there were attempts to uh, indoctrinate me in different ways. Uh, but, but that felt like a change. Yeah, that was, that was the most profound moment moment yeah and also realizing that you're going to die along with that that's that comes a little earlier than that so the two of those combined uh, you know i think you realize you're going to die about five or six well i don't have any memory of this you you remember this stuff yeah i, I couldn't sleep nights because you thought you were going to die or because you knew you were going to die i knew i was going to die and i knew that the world would come to an end and that uh we that would exist that the whole world comes to an end or your world comes to an end? The entire world. And it bothered me at the age of five or six. Yeah. And, and, and then a little later, you, you, you realized there was no God. Uh, it's not realized I, I came to the conclusion for me. There was, yeah. I mean, it's not that I respect other religions, but for any religion, but. 
So how, how, how do you think that affected you moving forward from there? Well, I think it made me a lot more of a serious person, you know, and uh, uh, I mean, I, I, you know me for a long time, but I, you know, I, I think gradually became more responsible for who I am. From, from age six on? <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that changed. So that changed me. And, uh, you know, that was, you said, what was my first moment of change? Yeah, that, that, that made me a, a, a sad person, maybe, you know. It's, sad? Yeah, now, when you realize that things, the world uh, will come to an end. It's, it's not a very great, uh, yeah. What's, what's the most pivotal change in your life? Was that it? Or was there something after that that, was that the most profound change you have ha ever had? Or that was just the first one? It's pretty profound, right? Yeah. Uh, and It'd be the most profound one, but maybe there's something else that happened. No, I think that's that's it. Interesting. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, we're constantly, every day, we're bombarded from the, uh, as from the time you're an infant, with uh, information and ideas and so forth. I never bought it. I never, like, I refused to stand to the national anthem at a very early age. Um, I opposed uh, U.S. wars at a very early age. Um, and uh, I just really who I am. I just became anti-war. And then I became anti-capitalist after that, uh, whatever that means. Again, you know, that may mean a lot of things. And... Uh, Yeah, so I, I, I mean, but, you know, one has to examine what that really means, anti-capitalism. So I pursued what I uh, thought was probably possible, and I uh, objected to what was probably impossible. So I was... Uh, you objected to what was impossible? Yeah, I, I avoided what was probably impossible. You know, pursue what is probably possible, and uh, reject what is probably impossible. And I think that would be the focus of my life, although I would say that my life is not really very conventional, so I love it. I do some. So what's, the, what's the possible, within the realm of possibility that you would like to see, most see happen? Um, in the world or in your life, you choose. That's too personal. Okay, in the world then. Um, in the world. Uh, you know, I don't believe, you know, I, I can't say peace on earth and goodwill onto people <laughs> or men. You can't? Uh, no, I don't like that, those kinds of phrases. I don't like uh, phrase mongering. But that's in the, in the realm of possibility? No, I, I don't know. I mean, I actually don't think we're going to see the end of wars. I don't think we're going to see the end of capitalism in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes, if we have them. Uh, it's really sad. Uh, but I would argue that uh, what, for me, I would like to be part of a... Uh, successful state uh, that creates a socialist system. And I think that's probably possible. If you really want my personal opinion. So, but, so in terms of the realm of possibility, that's what surprises me that, that when, when someone has the audacity to call themselves, I mean, and I'm sure you'd make, you'll make a distinction, but to basically use the word socialist in his presidential campaign, and that you don't think that's significant um, in America, I, I find it kind of draw dropping. Um, yeah, it's, it's, but, uh, it, it, but it interests me. Sanders supported many wars uh, throughout the world. Sanders did. He supports corporate interests in his body. You know, he's he's a member of the system. You yeah, know, we talked about the system, and Bernie Sanders is in the system. He yeah. defines himself as democratic socialist. Uh, in his policies, he's supported uh, big business to a great extent. He, there were very few wars that he objected to. 
uh, although I do agree with his positions now to oppose a number of wars um, and uh, supporting a Palestinian state, which is something that I consider very important. What wars did he, uh, did he uh, vote for? Uh, Iraq. All, all, I, all I hear is... Iraq, Iraq for instance. No, uh, well, he claims he opposed it. Uh, but the early ones, I think uh, he, he supported. I mean, he makes a big deal out of he, he opposed it and Biden supported it. Yeah, that's true. You're talking about the first Iraq war. That's true. I mean, you're talking about the second Iraq war. But, you know, I, I think he supported a number of other U.S. interventions around the world in the Middle East. I'm not, you know... I, you know I, you may want to cut that part out. And maybe I'm I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I think he, he opposed the first Iraq War. Well, he yeah he, he was one of the few who did, but he supported the Afghanistan intervention. That's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, but you know, I, I I think it's you know I'd like to see him do well. It's very interesting. What do you I, think of uh, AOC? I I haven't really thought much about it. About her? Yeah, I don't know much about her. But, uh, I know she's a New York... Uh, well, who, who, who are your mo role models out there? Or not role models. Who, who do you think is doing a good job in the public world space? I don't have any. Not one? Not one. I mean, they're all dead. Who, okay. Well, I, I know if I asked you who, about the dead ones, it would be so controversial. People would turn off the podcast immediately. <laughs> But I could, if you want no, to say them. People like Marx, Lenin, Al, yeah. People Stalin? Like what? No, I didn't Stalin? Say that. Huh? No. No. I didn't say that. Okay, good. Not without Marx. Did you say Mao? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, people make mistakes. We all entitled <laughs> People make mistakes. Um, I mean, I have a number of role models. I mean, most of them uh, today, most of them you haven't heard of that, uh, the, their names. You don't know who they are. Well, tell me uh, one and tell uh, me. Uh, uh, around the world, I have uh, a number of people who I have a tremendous amount of admiration for. Uh, tell me one person you admire and why. why? I'd rather not give their names because of security reasons. They're not famous? No, I, 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 they, they haven't... Uh, they should give their authorization for me to talk about them. They're not public figures? I'm talking about public figures. Oh, public figures. Um, no, I would say that that's what I'm saying, that some of these people are not are, are public figures, but they may not want their names used. Uh, and if, I would say that they're, they are people who are extremely uh, motivated uh, by social transformation. I use social... Uh, but they work in secret or something? No. Uh, so some of them do in some respects, but some of them don't. They're very open about what they're doing. They're fighting for the rights of the jobless. They're fighting for the uh, rights for people to get electricity and water uh, to, in their homes. But there's a danger uh, in giving them publicity? Uh, I, I, you know, I would first want to ask them. I don't think their names are that important. All right. That's, I, that's, I, I, that I, I, seems that's, that's, strange that you would want to ask. You would want to ask somebody to, to, to say that you admire them, uh, to get permission to be able to say that you admire them. It's, uh, no, some of these people may not want to be public. So, so that, uh, that's what I'm saying. They're, they're, they're something uh, uh, That means that they're actually doing good work then. Think about I, it. I, I hear what, I, I, what I hear you saying is that they're not, they're working Below in, the radar, off the radar. Behind the, behind the scenes and they're not, that would be the opposite of pub a public figure or, or that's not exactly the same as a public necessarily hmm. oh well then they're they're a public figure and then they're doing things secretly that that, that is unknown if to the public. person is not famous necessarily they shouldn't be i should ask their permission okay uh in this context especially since i don't know what you're going to do with this goddamn interview <laughs> It really looks I'm going to shut the Joe Rogan. Yeah, I, I, I have to be careful with these. You know. I, I do a lot of work around the world uh, with uh, social movements, or at least I try to.
uh, and that's the focus of my my um, satisfaction in the world. So that's why I want one of the uh, majority of people who are poor on the planet. Give and me one. Give me an example of one one that you've done recently. Well, I definitely support the uh, people of Mindanao, which is a island in the south of the Philippines, who are uh, struggling for, I mean, not only the indigenous people, but also the peasants and so forth, who are struggling for a uh, decent wage, uh, for electricity, for water, for enough food to uh, live on and so forth. Uh, and also maybe struggling for something bigger, you know, control over the land that they had stolen from them by the, you know, gigantic corporations like um, Dole or Del Monte, uh, Sumifru, et cetera. You know, there are a lot of fifes and so forth in the banana industry, but there are many other people like that. But the, that's an example of a population that I, I really care about. Uh, it's not just the indigenous people of Mindanao, it's also the peasants who came there, there many of them were forced to migrate there. So uh, can I assume that there, that leaders, that some of the leadership fighting for them are the people that you admire? Well, what are you trying to extract from me, Ben? <laughs> I'm, I'm just putting the dots together. So that's good. You're not, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not doing this thing. I'm not doing what? Oh, now I just revealed some great secret. Okay. never mind. I'll let the audience, I'll edit that part out and let the audience connect the dots. <laughs> I think you'll do much better with other people, interviewing other people. All right. People that don't wear Mark's 2000 shirts. Mark's 200? Oh, 200th anniversary? Well, it wasn't. He was born in 1818. 1818? Yeah. Huh. So this is a relatively new shirt that I got actually in the Philippines. Cool. T of a comrade last year right around now this last year all right so you're a very good interview but don't publish it so <laughs> well thank you manny ness i appreciate your being my first guinea pig and uh it's an honor and privilege to know you and this will hit the presses uh by 6 a.m tomorrow before you have a chance to edit it and um Oh, please, no, uh, I'll circulate it amongst my 5,000 friends and family and embarrass er you and me. Yeah. All of us. Thanks for listening to the Nature Breakthroughs podcast with Dr. Wild Ben Goldman to discover what you need for personal, organizational, and societal change. Get your free download of three ancient rituals smart entrepreneurs use to bounce back from shifts in the market and inside themselves. Go to www.naturebreakthroughs.com.